Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I uh, first want to make sure that everybody can hear me. Um, we have a Q&A button down at the bottom and there's also a chat. Um, can somebody either unmute or put something there to let me know? Okay, great. So I see from several people that you can hear. All right. We will get started here in just a second. I'm getting a message to give everybody just another minute to log on. So give one more minute and then we will get started in case we've got a few people having trouble getting on. Hey, Ashley, thank you for presenting today. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I will be here and helping to field some of the questions in the chat bar if you uh, receive any. Um, awesome. For those that are attending, you can write a message to in the chat bar or you can use the feature to raise your hand and um, that will grab both Ashley and I's attention so that we can respond. Yes. And if you have a question and um, if you want to try to, to ask it, then I'm happy to stop and answer questions. Or if you want to wait till the end um, and just maybe jot a note, then um, I'll be happy to stay on as long as I need to at the end to answer everybody's questions as well. OK, we'll go ahead and get started and I'll start introductions and we may have a few other people um, hopping on. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Get this set up right quick. Oops. Okay. And hopefully everybody can see a PowerPoint presentation and it has a title and a picture on it. Um, the title of today's presentation is Sensory Diet on a Budget. I um, want to talk about some ways that you can offer a child with sensory processing differences, um, some activities tailored to them, but on a budget. Um, especially being able to offer things in the home um, as we're still in this pandemic and lots of us are spending a lot more time at home. So that was the thought behind this presentation was just to give you um, some information about a sensory diet first, but then also to be able to talk about um, the different ways that you can offer a sensory diet um, with materials you already have in your home. Um, I'm Ashley Deaton. I'm an occupational therapist. I've been an occupational therapist for um, 22 years. Um, I'm the co-owner of One Step at a Time Therapy Services, and we're based here in Rowan County, but we cover about eight counties in the Piedmont. Um, we have about 40 therapists that work for us. Um, One Step is 14 years old this year. Um, Kathy Bailey and I started that company back in 2007. Um, I do have three children, and that's the picture that you see, um, Abby, Morgan, and Kiki, and they're 16, 14, and 7. Uh, we adopted Kiki whenever she was two, but I knew her from shortly after birth. Um, I started off as her therapist before I became her mom. Um, she was a referral to me uh, to work with uh, whenever she left the hospital and came home in, in, uh, to DSS custody. So we adopted her at two, and she is now seven. Um, I may reference her several times during this um, presentation because Kiki does have some significant sensory differences. Um, she has uh, severe disabilities. She has cerebral palsy. She has epilepsy, which means she has seizures. Um, she has seizure disorder. Um, she is also blind. So obviously we're gonna talk about the sense of vision and how important that is to development. And for her, that has heightened her sense of hearing. Um, so like I said, there are definitely sensory differences. And when we um, look at creating a sensory diet for a child, we pay attention to those individual needs. So I may reference her several times, but um, there is Miss Kiki smiling in the picture. 
So what are we going to learn about today? The outcomes or the things that I'd like you to be able to to talk about at the end of this are number one, what is a sensory diet? Um, to be able to give some examples of what that is, to be able to talk about what the purpose of a sensory diet is, um, how does it benefit a child, uh, to be able to describe why a sensory diet is necessary for a child that has sensory processing difficulties. And then also to be able to give multiple examples of how to create a sensory diet using inexpensive and household items. So we might all look for sensory input, okay? And that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is the sensory input, the input coming into our body through our different senses. So right now, as you're sitting listening to this, in order to stay awake as I'm droning on, you might be bouncing your knee, you might be twisting your hair on your finger, you might be chewing gum. Um, at the end of a long day, we might relax um, with a hot cup of, of something or um, get in the bathtub to unwind. We seek out that sensory input that we need, but a lot of times our kiddos with sensory differences either don't know what input they might be needing or they don't really know how to ask for that. So that's where a sensory diet comes in because we can offer them that input that they're looking for that we might seek out on our own without any help. So what is a sensory diet? We're not talking about a diet like me laying off cookies because bathing suit season's coming. Um, we are talking about a diet as in what is coming into your body. So just like your, your child might need food during the day, their diet, um, their need for sensory input also needs to be met. So a sensory diet, which was a term that was coined by an OT um, that's a leader in our field, Patricia Wilbarger, a sensory diet is a carefully designed personal activity plan. You've created a plan of different activities and different things that are gonna provide a child with that input that they need so that they can have <clears throat> that just right level of focus and organization during the day. Um, my practice focuses mainly on young children. With One Step, we, um, we only work with children. We don't work with adults. I mean, a lot of times those kids aren't able to understand or ask for the input that they might be seeking. The idea though, is as children get older and they become more aware of the input that they need, they're able to drive their own sensory diet. And what I mean by that is they can seek out that specific sensory input that they need. There are actually programs out there that OTs use a lot. Um, one of them you might've heard of is called, How Does Your Engine Run? That teaches a child how to be more aware of their sensory system and be aware of when this happens, I need this. Um, and that helps the child be more independent because it teaches them to, to pay attention to those cues of their body of what they might need so that they can seek out that input instead of waiting on an adult or a caregiver to provide that for them. So what is the purpose and benefit of a sensory diet? <clears throat> Generally, a child um, whose nervous system is over aroused or overstimulated, they're gonna need more calming input. And we're gonna talk about what that might look like in a little bit. Whereas a child who might be more under aroused, under stimulated, might have a look of being too tired, they're gonna need more alerting input to give them that just right level of, of being able to focus or attend. Um, that's where your OTs come in because they use their skills and their expertise to be able to develop that sensory diet that's based on your child's individual needs. Now we use lots of different assessments. Um, some of them are standardized assessments. Some of them are more what we call a functional assessment um, in order to look at what your child's sensory needs are. Um, I've listed a couple there just so you can be familiar with some names. Um, one is called the sensory profile, and that's where a therapist might sit down with a parent and or a teacher or other caregiver and ask questions um, that are specific to different sensory input and how your child might react to that so that we can determine what their response would be. There's another test that requires some additional training as an OT to, to give, but it's called the Sensory Integration and Praxis Test. It's actually 17 sections of a, a large um, comprehensive test that looks at how well your child can integrate all that information coming in from the different senses. Then we also use things like a sensory processing checklist, and that's just different examples 
um, of ways that your child might respond to sensory input. And what we do as OTs is we put all of that in together and use that information to compile, compile what we call a profile, which would be um, in most situations, my child would react this way. Um, in most situations, your child might be a seeker of tactile input, for instance. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that means later. So a sensory checklist gives the therapist a really good idea um, of exactly what you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. Because remember, we're only seeing a snapshot when we're in the home or in the preschool or, or um, daycare. Um, but it gives us a good idea of what you're seeing. So some questions you might um, get on that. Um, and you can listen through these and see if any of these might sound familiar to you um, if you have a child with sensory differences. Um, does your child resist being held or cuddled? Do they gag or vomit on textured foods or not eat a variety of different foods? Do they prefer to be naked or with very little clothing on? Are they upset by the tags in their shirts or the hems on their socks? Are they distressed when their hands or face are messy or dirty or sticky? Mm, that would be me. Um, are they a child that will not sleep if there's any noise? They have to have absolute silence or sometimes the opposite. Are they a child that won't sleep if it is silent and there has to be noise in the background? Um, are they a child that needs excessive help to fall asleep? Um, are they a child that craves movement, has to be moving constantly? Those are our energizer bunnies. Um, are they a child that can't focus attention on play or caregiver or the toy long enough to interact? Um, are they a kiddo that likes chewing on their hands or fingers or their clothes or the, um, their shirt? Are they a child that engages in head banging or biting or pinching? Are they a child that's distressed whenever they're having to switch between activities or transition from one area to another? All of those that I've just mentioned, and that's just a few, are things that can indicate possible difficulty with sensory processing. It's the way a child's processing that information coming in through the senses. So we as OTs use that information to create the sensory diet. And that's supposed to meet your child's individual needs by offering them what they need, um, A, in maybe a more appropriate or safer way, depending on what the input is that they're looking for and the environment that they're in when they do it, but also B, to try to desensitize if a child is, um, is overstimulated, trying to help them over time desensitize so they can tolerate that sensory input coming in. So first I wanna go over the seven senses because when I was in school, I was taught in kindergarten of five of these. So um, we actually recognize seven senses um, as OT. So I wanna go over these really quickly because we're gonna talk about these in depth and how you can offer input with these senses. Obviously your sense of vision that helps you create a picture of the environment, um, but that can also help you assess the distance between objects and it can help guide our body's movement. Um, vision is extremely important, and I would say the most important sense um, for a child in early development. And the reason I say that is um, if a child has vision difficulties, one of the things that they're going to have difficulty with before they're even speaking and can ask about what's in their environment is um, just developing gross motor skills. So for instance, you have a child that's learning how to sit up. They are gonna sit up the first time and as they start to lean over and fall, they are gonna see that horizon line shift and everything that's in front of them that they're looking at start to move. And that's gonna give feedback to the brain that their body is moving and falling over. So that the next time they sit up, when they start to see that horizon line shift, they might be able to throw that arm out to catch themselves before they fall all the way over. That's how you develop the concept of sitting and the developmental skill of sitting. And you, de you depend a lot on that sense of vision for that. So if vision is disturbed or with some of our babies, if every time they look, they're overstimulated by what they're seeing, then they're gonna try to block a lot of that out because it's just too much information and that's gonna impact their development. So the sense of hearing, that's gonna help us process sound to determine where the sound's coming from, um, but also to determine if it's important. This is a big deal for a lot of our kiddos that get overstimulated by sounds um, because for them, 
the sound of me talking is just as loud as the sound of the light above me humming. And that's just as loud as the sound of this squirrel that's out here determined he's gonna get my bird feed off my bird feeder. They have a hard time being able to differentiate between those different sounds and which one's the most important to focus in on. So it all becomes too much because they're hearing all of those sounds in the environment. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but that can be very overwhelming for our kiddos that we work with. The sense of touch is also extremely important in development and throughout our life. Um, touch receptors on our skin help us um, determine what might be harmful to the environment. They help us measure pain, help us measure pressure. Um, a good example is just being able to tilt a cup to drink out of an open cup. Um, our kiddos, you know, at one, one, one and a half years old are learning how to drink it out of an open cup. Your sense of touch helps you determine how much pressure you need to apply and how to tilt that cup so that it doesn't spill all over you. So the sense of touch is extremely important. Um, the sense of smell is helping us to determine threatening smells such as chemical smells, um, pleasurable smells like the, that we might have a positive reaction to. So some of our kiddos become overstimulated by threatening smells. Um, our sense of taste can help us distinguish between different foods um, and whether or not they are a food that we enjoy, whether or not it is um, a food that we enjoy the way it feels in our mouth, um, which is often an issue with our kiddos. Um, the last two senses you may not have heard of, but those are um, vestibular sense and your sense of proprioception. So the vestibular sense is what tells us where our body is in relation to the earth. So um, it's located in the inner ear. It helps us control our balance. It helps us control movement. So this sense, um, your receptor that's in your inner ear is telling your brain whether or not your body's moving or whether it's sitting still and also how fast you're moving. The sense of proprioception is located all throughout the body and is constantly giving feedback um, as you're moving because you have sensors in each joint of the body that are telling your body about its position in space. They're telling your body um, where your body parts are in relation to each other. So all of these senses combined are the information that our kiddos are receiving every day, every minute as they're moving. Um, this information is extremely important for us um, for development, but also to help our kiddos whenever they have too much information coming in um, to be able to let them know what information and let us know how to help them. So why is a sensory diet necessary? A lot of us have never experienced sensory processing disorder. We might have had a day that our senses were on edge. We might have had a day where we're in a crowded environment and um, having more difficulty focusing. Um, but a lot of us have never experienced what some of our kiddos have gone through. Um, so I wanna jump to this YouTube video. This gives you just a one minute snippet of what it might be like um, to experience walking through a mall as a child with a sensory processing disorder. And keep in mind as you're watching this, that only four or five of those seven senses are being stimulated. So you can only imagine if all seven were being stimulated at the same time. I'm gonna click on this so that we can watch this. I can't see it. Um, let me. Ashley, are we supposed to be able to see it or just hear it? That's bad boy. Yeah, you're not able to see it. No. Let me go to. You may have to go back to screen share and then give permission for that one. Okay. 
wonder if I go straight to YouTube instead of just using my link, would that work? Are you able to see it on the screen now? No. So if you try to hit the screen share button and then give permission for it to change from the PowerPoint to the other screen. All right. Now, do you see it? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Let me. Um, You're fine. Thank you. Make that big again and I'll just start that over. All right. Let me know if you can't hear it once I start it as well. I'm autistic and I just get too much information. Okay, so I felt like that was a really powerful um, illustration of what some of our kiddos go through um, in a, especially in a community setting. You can see how our, we're able to filter out a lot of that input. But for a lot of our kiddos, it's a lot more difficult to filter that out. So it becomes overwhelming really quickly. Um, so this is meant to illustrate why a sensory diet is necessary. Um, a sensory diet, the effects of that are usually immediate and cumulative. So what I mean by that as far as immediate is you should start to see a difference in your child's response once you start sensory diet activities. Um, you should see a difference in how they respond to that input. You should see a difference in whether or not they seek or avoid that input. But the effects are also cumulative because what we know from our research is that every time your child engages in that sensory diet, their nervous system is changing in response to that. So that the next time they interact with that same activity or that same input, um, their nervous system has changed to be better able to interact with it. So those changes are lasting. So that's why it's so important and why a sensory diet is so necessary is you are actually changing the child's nervous system and the way that they respond to the sensory input. So now we're gonna go through some slides that um, look at the um, different senses and how you would incorporate some activities into a sensory diet based on how the child responds to that sense. So we're gonna start with vision. For a child that seeks visual input, those are the kiddos that they find opportunities to watch objects. They wanna watch um, things spin, move, flash. Um, they like that visual input. Um, so I've listed some things that we use with them, but they usually like fast moving, bright, um, unpredictable visuals, um, strobe light effects for some kids um, are things that they look for. Those are your kids that um, a lot of times will really enjoy video games or fast moving cartoons because they're getting those um, bright, unpredictable visuals as they're watching that. 
We also have the opposite end of the spectrum. We have kiddos that avoid visual input. And those are the ones that might squint. They might hold their head down um, in an environment where they're visually overstimulated. They might just avoid eye contact altogether. Um, some of the things that we try to do to help with that when we look at a sensory diet, um, I've had kids that do really well when they go to the grocery store with mom if they wa um, wear a hat with a brim because that is filtering out some of that visual input. So now I've filtered out some of that bright fluorescent light that's in my eyes. I'm filtering out because, you know, I'm a young kid, so I'm a lot shorter than all the adults. So I'm filtering out having to look at a lot of that. Um, also wearing sunglasses can help because that can make um, the area dimmer. Um, a lot of times we'll recommend dimming the lights in the child's environment that they're in until they're better able to interact um, in the regular lighting that's in that room. A lot of times these kids really enjoy slow moving visuals or walls that are just sparsely decorated and are not every inch of the wall having something on it because for them that's just too visually overstimulating. Moving on to the sense of hearing. Our hearing seekers or those kids that are seeking auditory input are those that always want things loud. Um, they are your kids that always want the TV on. They're upset if it's not. Um, they all they love making noises and usually they're the ones making the noise, um, but they love any noise in their environment. So um, we try to give them ways to still be able to create that noise, but in an appropriate way or safe way. Um, so I've listed some things there on the slide that we offer. Um, those are kids that are really um, respond well to a strong drum beat. If you're playing some music in the background, that will give them a lot of what they're looking for, that strong uh, drum beat. The opposite side of that are we have um, kids that avoid um, input through their ears or auditory input. They're the kids that always want things quieter. They might cover their ears. They might try to leave a noisy environment. Um, for those kids, we uh, have used headphones. We've used earplugs. We've used um, having them wear earbuds that's playing soft music so that they can focus on that music instead of the other noise um, outside. Um, slow rhythmic music is helpful. Nature sounds are often helpful, like just the sound of rain um, or the sound uh, like a static sound, um, you know, sounds of birds chirping. Um, those are sounds that, that can be helpful or calming if a child avoids that, that, that um, input. Smell. For kids that might be seeking olfactory input, those are ones that find opportunities to smell things whenever they can. So um, kiddos that might come up and smell your shirt because they smell the laundry detergent. Um, kids that smell um, their food before they eat it. Now, sometimes they're smelling it because they want to make sure how it's going to feel or taste in their mouth. But other kids really do enjoy that smell and they smell items. Um, there are lots of things out there. There's scented crayons, scented Play-Doh, scented markers, um, scratch and sniff stickers. Um, essential oil roll-ons um, to be able to give that child that input they're seeking um, in an appropriate way. Um, kiddos that might avoid smells, they can actually find smells noxious. Um, I've worked with many children who might gag when they smell foods cooking or they might smell a certain candle burning. Um, older kids will tell you that certain smells give them a headache. Um, so a lot of times we'll work with a sensory diet to try to avoid um, strong scented candles or room sprays, um, trying to use a fan that might dissipate the smell of food cooking in the evening so that that's not overwhelming to them as mom's cooking supper. Those are just a couple ideas of things that we use. For the sense of touch, kids that seek tactile input, which is what we call touch input, they like getting their hands messy. They have no problem with going outside and getting dirty. Um, they touch everything in their environment. They might look for foods that are spicy or have distinct flavors. So things that we do are we use that to our advantage. We're going to use messy play to teach concepts. Um, we're going to allow them to sculpt, finger paint, cut and paste, sew, um, Kids that seek input, uh, tactile input, love a ball pit, um, spaghetti ball. Um, as far as the input in their mouth, we might give them oral chew fidgets because a child that's seeking that input is gonna put everything in their mouth. Um, and they may put some things in their mouth that they um, shouldn't be. Um, 
for safety reasons. And so we would give them a fidget um, to chew on that would give them that input that they're looking for, but in an appropriate way. For kids that might avoid tactile input, those are your kids that might avoid finger feeding because they don't want their hands to get messy. Um, they might also be a picky eater. Those are your kids that are gonna shy away from the paint table whenever it's time to finger paint. Um, they are not gonna want you know, messy hands. So a lot of times what we do is we try to slowly introduce those more messy play opportunities. Um, we might wanna have them eating um, chewy foods that, that require more chewing. Um, we might want to have them use a chewy tube. We might want to have them use um, utensils for messy food first and then introduce, um, slowly introduce finger feeding so that it's not um, so much of an impact on their sensory system for them to have to touch that food and put it in their mouth and see what it feels like in their mouth. For sense of taste. Um, we have kids that seek that taste input. They're looking for extreme temperatures. They're looking for distinct flavors. Um, think Cool Ranch Doritos and a Sundrop. Um, those are your kids that really want all of that input in their mouth. Um, just a couple ideas um, of things that we provide for these kiddos to give them that. I have a kid right now that eats frozen pickle chunks. Um, it gives him the temperature, gives him that strong taste. Um, he loves it. It gives them that input that he's looking for frozen orange sections, um, drinking tart juices like grapefruit juice or cherry juice um, is another opportunity to give them that input. On the opposite side, you've got um, kids that avoid that taste input and eat french fries and french fries. Um, they're gonna tend to go toward your more bland flavors, your starchy foods. Um, this is a little bit more difficult because whenever you're adding any kind of spice or flavor, that's an assault to their system because they don't want to have to taste it very much. They just want to chew it and swallow it and get it over with. So um, it's a little more difficult um, to, to work with this as far as um, adding a sensory diet activity. But a lot of times we can try to add vegetables in first being breaded and fried like the French fries that they're used to and then working on branching out to having a vegetable in a different way. Um, trying to offer small amounts of a spice or flavor into a bland diet, like trying to offer a small amount of butter or salt in their mashed potatoes. Um, a lot of times with these kiddos, we will first offer other flavors by using dips and condiments. So we will be dipping into mayonnaise or ketchup or ranch dressing, um, just trying to offer a different flavor on top of the things that we know they'll already eat. For proprioception, which remember is how your body knows where it is in space and how it knows where, where body parts are in relationship to each other. Kids that are seeking that input are our kids that are constantly moving. They love to run, jump, crash on the couch. Um, the activities that I've listed are all those different things that you can offer them, um, wall push-ups tug of war, um, a compression vest or a weighted vest, pushing a cart or carrying a laundry basket that's full of items, um, a crash pad, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, riding a bicycle uphill, using a trampoline. All of those are gonna give those receptors in their joints that information to send back to the brain of where their body is in space and it helps calm them and regulate their sensory system. Kids who avoid proprioception are your kids that are gonna not choose activities where their body's moving quickly or forcefully. They're gonna be your kiddos that are gonna shy away from a lot of the playground equipment. Um, this is where we would teach some different techniques like massage and different touch techniques that help slowly um, adjust that child to more input in the joints so that they can be more comfortable with that input coming in. Vestibular input. That again is where your body is in relation to the ground or the earth. So um, kids that seek this are your swingers, your spinners, um, your kids that love tumbling and rolling, like being upside down, uh, like doing somersaults. Um, so those are the activities that we wanna give them. Anything that gives them that movement that they're seeking um, within safety reasons, um, is what we want to offer to them so that they can have that input in appropriate way. 
The opposite of that is kids that avoid that vestibular input. So they're not going to want to do the um, where you pick them up and make them an airplane um, where their kid where their you know feet are off the ground. That's going to make them feel uh, really uncomfortable and overstimulated. So uh, we might start with some slow rocking. We might then try to get them on a rocking horse um, where they've got some of that movement. We might try sitting on a therapy ball or an exercise ball and providing some physical um, support or stability, such as holding onto their shoulders or their hips so that they feel more safe and comfortable, but they're still getting some of that movement um, to help them tolerate that better. So now I've given some examples that I want us to, to look at of sensory diet on a budget. So I didn't go through um, every sense, but I wanted to give you some examples of some things that you could do at home. So for visual input, a child that is a seeker or a child that um, is an avoider, but you're wanting to slowly introduce some visual input to them. Um, you can go and buy these really cool fiber optic lights. Um, they're $2,000 in a therapy catalog. <laughs> um, you can also find um, in a local store for about $10, something called a bubble timer that as you turn it over, you'll see colored bubbles of, of liquid moving. And that can be um, very stimulating for a child, give them the input they're looking for. Um, but a good homemade version of that is to take an empty soda bottle, wash it out and fill it with vegetable oil to water at a three to one ratio. So three times vegetable oil, one times water. And then you could add a few drops of food coloring to that, and you could watch that movement of the oil and water and the food coloring. Um, then if you want to add more movement, you could do so by um, adding an Alka-Seltzer tablet. Um, and then that as that moves in the bottle, um, all, everything else moves around it. And that can be um, very stimulating for, for a child that's looking for that input. Another example of sensory diet on a budget for proprioceptive input. There are things out now that you may have seen called a pea pod. Looks like a, like a green pea pod that a child can sit down in, like in this first example. They're about $140 in a therapy catalog. I know that some other places are um, offering them now and you might can get them a little cheaper commercially. Um, it's just a blow up bladder inside um, some fabric that's zipped around it um, that forms that pod shape. You could do something very similar by either taking a large body pillow like the little girl is laying in here or um, two body pillows that you buy from the store and then take an extra large zip tie and zip tie each end of that to make it tight. Um, then that creates your pod and then they can lay in the middle of that and you've done that for $40. Um, the other free homemade version um, would be to take the cushions off your couch. You can either take cushions and pull your couch away from the wall and make a V with those cushions and you've got the couch on this side and the wall on the other and then that child feels that squeezing proprioceptive input when they lay down between those cushions or you can make um, a sandwich like um, the siblings are doing in this picture where you have one child laying on the cushion. He's got a cushion on his back and then his brother is on top of that. Um, that gives him that proprioceptive, that deep pressure input that he's looking for, that sends those messages to his brain from those um, receptors. Um, vestibular input, again, that is where you know where your body is in relation to the earth or the ground. So those are kiddos that like to jump, like to spin, like to swing. Um, you can buy a $300 crash pad um, from a therapy catalog, and it will be perfect for those crashing behaviors. Um, you could also go to a local store and for about $100, you could get a foam pad like you would put on top of a mattress. Um, I've also had other parents tell me that they go to like a family dollar or another store that has um, pet supplies and they've bought the largest dog bed that they could buy and then they take that, that fabric off. And what's left is that piece of thick, good foam that that child can then jump and crash onto. Um, again, those couch cushions are, are pulling double duty for sensory diet because for zero dollars and homemade, take those couch cushions. Um, what the little kiddo is doing in this picture is what we call um, a cushion ladder. So he's got to try to step up those cushions and it's a ladder up onto the couch. That's giving him that good vestibular input as he's having to shift his weight and get up onto the couch. Um, the other thing you could do is simply lay those couch cushions on the floor um, and allow the child to crash and jump into those. 
for tactile input, if we're talking about um, sensory diet on a budget, you can get a gel manipulative um, pad that is about $50. It's really cool, this one here, that's got the blue gel and it's got the little fishies and different things in it um, that the child could work on manipulating. Um, for about $15, you can get a similar, a smaller version of that at a local store that's just a gel pad that might have some things in it. But an excellent way to make something with homemade materials is to take a Ziploc bag, either fill it with hair gel or fill it with an oil, water, and food coloring mix. And then you can add anything else into it you want. So you can add beads, um, you could add coins, you could add shapes, puzzle pieces, anything you want. And then my recommendation would be to double bag it so that we don't have a gel explosion, but then lay that on a surface like what you see in the third picture and allow that child to really explore that. You can talk about moving um, all the items to the top and so then you're pushing all the gel to the top of the bag, moving it down to the bottom so that you're talking about those concepts. You can, um, whatever you have in there, you um, like the beads that you put in, you could say, okay, move all the red beads to this side and all the green beads to this side. Um, it's an excellent way for any academic concept that you're teaching to add a sensory component because you can lay a clear gel bag on top of anything. Um, if the child's working on practicing writing their letters or drawing shapes, lay a gel bag on top of that paper and have them practice drawing that circle on that gel bag and feel that gel move under their fingers as they're drawing the circle. It's an excellent way to add sensory to any academic activity. Another example of tactile input is um, making a sensory bin or an explore bucket is, is what we like to call it too. So you can buy a pre-made um, bucket for about $80 that's got this colored really cool sand and all these little manipulatives that go with it based on different themes. You could go to a local store and for about $20, you could get a tube of plastic animals and then you could go out and get your own, you know, other materials to go with it and make a, an explore bucket. Um, but the simplest way is to take an empty container like I did here. Um, we ate all the cheese balls. So I took my empty cheese ball container and we made a nature explore bucket. So I went outside um, and put pine cones, weeds, grass, rocks, sticks, um, flowers, and then also plastic animals um, in there that we were specifically talking about for that theme with the child I was working with, and then have them work on um, being able to get, get their hand in there and touch and pull that out. This is really good for your sensory avoiders, your kiddos that don't like a lot of input. Um, one trick for this though is when you're making this, have them involved in also making it. So it's things they remember putting in. They know they put that pine cone in. So that makes that pine cone a little more safe to touch um, than just looking at it and not being really sure what that's gonna feel like when they touch it if they weren't the one to put it in. Um, but that's an excellent way, again, that you can use that for any theme, any time of year, any holiday, making different um, season, um, explore buckets based on the season and going out and getting the items that are out there um, for that season and working on that tactile input. So here are just some more examples of um, homemade sensory diet ideas. Um, having a child sit on an old sheet and pulling them across the smooth floor, like a wooden floor or linoleum floor, that gives them a lot of good vestibular input. So on a, on a rainy day, when you can't get outside and jump on the trampoline or let them run and jump, um, that's a good way to still give them that input. Um, using an old mattress as a trampoline or a foam pad. Um, tying a thick rope from a tree branch and having the child hold with their hands and swing or climb that, that rope. Um, a lot of our kiddos today, just from our more sedentary lifestyle over the past 30 years, don't have the upper body strength that they need. And they don't seek out activities like just swinging or climbing a rope um, tied to a tree. So that's an excellent opportunity to build in some of that input. Um, there are lots of good recipes online for how to do homemade Play-Doh, homemade finger paint, um, cooking spaghetti noodles, and then painting with spaghetti noodles. 
um, cooking spaghetti noodles and then putting a spaghetti noodle on a plate and you have to make a circle out of that spaghetti noodle or a square or the letter P. Um, it's great to add sensory into that. Making a hammock swing by taking a big old sheet and tying it between two trees or onto two posts. Um, then that again, that vestibular input of being able to swing back and forth if you can't get to the playground. Blowing bubbles with a straw um, using either water, dish detergent, that's good um, input. That's good alerting input for a kid that might not have a lot of input um, orally. Moving cotton balls by blowing through a straw, that's a really good game to play to give them some input they might need. If they're a kid that likes to put a lot of things in their mouth, you're um, having a race to see if you can push all the cotton balls to the other side of the table before they push them back over by blowing through a straw. Um, vacuuming, sweeping, mopping, pushing furniture, pushing a wheelbarrow. You're going to think I'm saying you need to give your kids chores, but what I'm saying is all of those activities are heavy work where they're having to push something and use their body weight to make it move. Um, that gives them that proprioceptive input they're looking for because every time they push that couch or push that wheelbarrow, they're receiving all that input through their joints and that's sending that message to the brain. And remember that's making lasting changes on their nervous system. So that next time they might not need quite as much input for quite as long before they get the input they need. Um, doing handstands on the wall, um, playing listening games. Um, for a child that has difficulty filtering out all the different sounds in the environment, you play a listening game where you say, okay, all I want you to pay attention to is that bird chirping. And when you hear it, raise your hand. That really forces them to slow down, focus, listen for that one specific sound, and it's teaching them how to drown out those other sounds around them. You could do the same with playing smelling games for a child that has difficulty with smelling different smells. Um, play what animal am I walking like, where you walk like a bear, and then they have to guess what kind of animal might walk like that, and then they have to try to do that same thing. That's helping um, build those proprioceptive and vestibular skills and visual because they're watching to see what you're doing. Monkey bars. Oh my goodness. Climbing on monkey bars is, is very um, helpful for our kiddos because again, anything they're hanging from or trying to pull their body up on is giving them that proprioceptive input. You could mimic that by hanging from a closet rod as long as your closet rods are very sturdy. Um, just give that disclaimer. Don't say Miss Ashley said to hang and then they fell in the closet. Um, you can also buy a doorway pull-up bar for about $20 in Walmart that attaches in a doorway. That's a really good um, activity to add to a sensory diet to have them try to pull their body weight up. Um, gives lots of good sensory input. So those are just some extra ideas, um, some ways that you could do things um, on a budget with things that you have in your home. Um, those are the resources that I used. Um, I know that we're recording this, but I'm also happy to email a copy of the PowerPoint to anybody that would like that. So um, this next slide is my contact information, and I'm sure you could also get it from Miss Amy or anybody at Partners. But um, all those resources, these websites give you excellent ideas for ways to provide sensory input at home, um, ways to, to create a sensory diet. Um, then this YouTube link is just that link of the, the video that we watched about um, what it feels like to walk through a mall if you have sensory processing disorder. And then we've got some links here at the bottom for a couple different books that are absolutely amazing for learning more about um, sensory differences in children. So here is my contact info slide. Uh, feel free to write that information down. Um, call me, text me, email me if you have questions. Um, if you'd like more information, if you want a copy of the PowerPoint, um, I'm also happy at this point to um, answer any specific questions that you might have. Um, and I think Miss Amy said you could either do that through the chat or through the Q&A. Um, so I am here and ready if you've got any questions for me. Thank you, Ashley. This was wonderful. Um, if if you would like, Ashley, you can email me the presentation and I'll put it in a email response when they fill out the survey. Perfect. Yes, I'll do that.
Just a reminder to everyone, there will be a survey sent out tomorrow via email. Um, if you are looking to receive credits for attending today, you will need to complete that survey. Um, it's something that is required. And then at the end of the week, we will email you your certificate, especially if you have attended more than one presentation this week. Okay, so um, excellent question in the chat right now from Miss Suzanne. She said, you had said that we need to give this input to work on things. This kid has done well until COVID and now they are showing different sensory concerns. Is this normal after being isolated? Absolutely. Think about after you're no longer coming into contact, like say this is a child that went to preschool previously and now they're home, or even if they were home all along, but now they're no longer going to the grocery store with mom and dad. Um, now they're no longer going on as many community outings or out to eat at restaurants. Um, that absolutely has effect on your sensory system because your, sense, your nervous system depends on that input coming in continuously. So when you're no longer getting as much input, your threshold or the level at which you're okay with starts to get lower and lower and lower. Um, so a lot of times we see a kid who has either been put into a different environment or now because of the pandemic, because of being much more isolated, um, isn't getting the same amount of sensory stimulation you're gonna see definitely a difference because my threshold is now down here because I haven't been exposed to all of this stuff that I was doing every day before. So we've got to be able to desensitize again. In other words, offering that input at just right level of challenge so that my, my threshold, the level at which I'm okay with, gets back up to where it was before. So you're gonna to try to offer that input in small amounts. Um, you're going to try to offer it um, at opportune times of the day. So what I mean is not first thing in the morning, not last thing of the day before they go to bed. Um, when you're trying to offer input to increase a child's tolerance, um, you're going to offer it when you feel like they're at their peak, whatever their peak time is of day. Um, that's when you want to try to offer that because it is going to be a challenge to their system. Any other questions? Let's see, I've got in the q and I've got, what can I do for a child who refuses to eat or touch new foods? I try to just put it beside the child, but the child often screams or gets up from the table. Okay, so um, like I said, whenever we talked about um, picky eaters, this is often a very difficult area to address. It's often an area that takes much longer to see a difference in. Um, one of the first things we say is that a child has to tolerate touching a food before they're ever gonna to tolerate putting it in their mouth. So one of the first things is, are they just okay seeing it? Which it sounds like if you put it beside the child, the child is screaming or getting up from the table. So the first thing I would suggest is say it's corn um, that, that you're trying to introduce that they have never eaten or refuse to eat. Um, put some kernels of corn on a small plate and put it in the middle of the table. Nobody touches the plate of corn. Nobody really references the plate of corn. If the child gets upset and try to push it away, the expectation is the corn has to stay here. You don't have to eat it. You don't have to touch it, but the corn has to stay here while we all eat. And then you move on and distract the child with something else. Um, that's the first thing that we try is just getting them to be okay even seeing the food. Then the next thing would be touching it. So are they okay just as we're cleaning up the table, being the one to pick up that plate of corn and dump it into the trash? Then are they the one to take a fork and, and you know scrape it off of the plate? Then are they the one that will take a spoon and scoop the corn and put it in your mouth so that you eat it? You see how you're getting step by step by step closer to the corn? <laughs> um, that is often what it takes is a very systematic baby steps approach to allowing them to be more comfortable um, with that food before you're ever going to see them put that food in their mouth and try it for themselves. Any other questions? Amy, I don't think I'm seeing any more. Are you seeing any new ones? I am not. Let me look at this one. Nope, that is that is all that I see. Okay. 
Well, like I said, my on the last slide, which um, I'm going to send to Amy so that um, you'll have the, the presentation. If you think about a question you have later, I'm happy to, to answer texts, emails. Um, if you want more information on sensory diet or you want me to give you more resources that are out there or point you towards specific websites, I'm happy to do that as well. Thank you so much, Ashley, and I'll be sending out a copy of the presentation to everyone. All right. Thank y'all. Hope you have a good afternoon. Thanks. You too.